Hi, this is Chris Young. Welcome to episode 41 of Contemplating Life. This week we'll continue with more stories from my many years of volunteer ministry for St. Gabriel Catholic Church. Continuing with stories from my eight years of serving on the Finance Committee and later on on the Parish Pastoral Council. My standard disclaimers. I'm not trying to evangelize or to preach to anyone. I'm just telling my stories. Also, this is my best recollection of an event from over 30 years ago. Some of the details may be wrong or out of sequence, but this is what I remember the way I remember it. As you've seen in these past few episodes, the work on the Finance Committee at St. Gabriel was intense, but it built a camaraderie among us. We worked hard, but we had a good time as well, often joking around with one another. One of my fondest memories was a discussion in which we were trying to decide how much to increase a particular line item. Should it be 10% or 11%? I don't remember if it was me or a committee member named Julie who suggested 11% sounds like a better number. Someone asked why. Julie and I looked at each other and grinned and simultaneously said, because it's one more. Then we both burst into laughter hysterically at the reference to the classic film Spinal Tap. Neither of us had any idea we were fans of the movie before that day. It just happened that way. Other committee members looked at us like we were crazy, wanted to know what was so funny. We both said, Spinal Tap. They still had no idea what we were talking about. By the way, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I included a YouTube clip in the description. We also very much enjoyed our December meeting because that was our annual Christmas party. We would dispense with our business as quickly as possible and then bring out the snacks, turn on the Christmas music, open a bottle of wine, and have a really good time. Larry, the chairman of the committee, always brought a really great cheese ball made by his wife. Somehow that started a tradition that the chairman brought the cheese ball. When I was the chairman, they liked my mom's recipe almost as well as the one made by Larry's wife. But as much fun as we had, there were still times when controversies arose and the differences had to be worked out. The Parish Pastoral Council was governed by a set of bylaws. We loosely followed normal parliamentary procedure where someone would make a motion, someone would second the motion, then we would have discussion, call the question, and followed by a vote. The strange thing was that we had to find what was called consensus. The theological theory was that God has a plan for us, and it's our job to prayerfully discern that plan and implement it, so there could be no division among us. Therefore, consensus essentially meant a unanimous vote on everything. If we really are guided by the Holy Spirit, there could be no division among us. And the Holy Spirit guides each of us differently. So maybe that one dissenting voice is the right answer. In practice, what we said was, you don't have to totally agree with it 100%, but you have to be able to live with it. Our council members were strongly encouraged to sort of go with the flow and side with the majority. Now, I'm not saying you had to rubber stamp everything was proposed. You could raise objections, and often people did. The bottom line was that one individual had the power to block, veto, or essentially filibuster anything. On one occasion, when I was the finance chairman, there was a guy named John on the pastoral council. John had been finance chairman before me, so we had worked together for a couple of years. We're pretty good friends. He objected to the budget, which sort of pissed me off, because he knew the kind of work that had gone into it, having been in my position before. We spent the entire evening listening to his objections, trying to understand his concerns, and to address them. 
the evening ended in an impasse. We were all sent home to pray over it and come back again in a week. The finance committee met in a special meeting a few days later to see if we could come up with a proposal that would address John's concerns. I made a little speech in the committee meeting, which got me in some hot water. I really kind of screwed up. It was my intent to speak in John's defense, but I started out really poorly. I really regretted it. Rather than start out saying, I want to defend John, but... Instead, I said, I want to say a few things about John. I like the guy, but he can be a real pain in the ass. Before I could finish my sentence, Father Paul stepped in and stopped me from going any further. But I insisted and continued talking and said, No, I'm not here to criticize him. I'm here to empathize and support him. You see, I'm a pain in the ass also. As much as John frustrates me, I have to defend him because I want the right to be the same kind of pain in the ass as he is. Anyway, when we came back for the second meeting, John didn't show up. The budget passed through consensus without him. I don't recall if we ever made any adjustments or if it passed in its original form. He later explained he really wasn't happy with it, but he could live with it. And that was sort of the definition of consensus. You had to be able to live with it. As I mentioned previously, the chairman of the Finance Committee automatically had a seat on the council as part of their job. And somewhere along the way, they amended the bylaws that said that the finance person could not participate in consensus on budget issues. Their vote didn't count. The finance chairman was allowed to otherwise participate in consensus on non-budgetary matters, just like any other council member. But they thought that the finance person would be biased in favor of the budget that they had worked so hard to present. I was always proud of the work we did, but I realized that we served at the pleasure of the council. I was offended by the idea, and this was even before I was the chairman. Did this mean that the school board representative should also not participate because the school budget was on the line? That was a big, big line item. Or what if you represented the maintenance committee? Did they not also have a vested interest in the budget? Even if you were a member at large and didn't have a specific role on the council, everyone there had their own priorities. My concern was, why would you exclude this veto power from the one person in the room who was the most knowledgeable about the budget? If the council voted to change the budget in a way that was detrimental to the financial status of the parish, it was the chairman of the finance committee that was the one person in the room who would be most likely to know that and to raise concerns about it. The idea that their opinion should not count in the final consensus, seemed idiotic to me. So after I was no longer on the finance committee, but was serving on the council for other reasons, I tried to get him to reverse that policy, but I was unsuccessful. I want to wrap up this series with some comments about my dear friend, Father Paul Landwerlin, who was our pastor throughout this time. I've mentioned him several times in this series, and in my previous faith series, in which I talked about my return to the church after nearly a nine-year absence. Father Paul and I had a great working relationship. I always felt that he respected me, and I deeply respect him to this day. But we both got on each other's nerves on several occasions, as you've already seen. There was one time there was a controversy about someone on the school staff doing some bad paperwork on finances. There wasn't anything nefarious going on. Nobody was dipping into the till. It was just that the record keeping sucked. Everything didn't always balance. There were just some procedural problems. Father met with the person in question to try to work things out. But he took John, who was the finance chairperson at the time, with him to the meeting. 
Well, word got out about this meeting, and several of the school people came to various finance committee members and said, why is the finance committee involved in this private personnel matter? Most of us on that committee had no idea what was going on, didn't even know about the meeting. At the next finance meeting, several of us complained why we were out of the loop on the issue. Father said it was just a staff issue, didn't have anything to do with our committee. He seemed upset we were making a big deal about it. In his mind, it was none of our business. John defended himself saying, hey, Father asked me to be there, so I went. Well, I wasn't upset with him. He was just doing what the boss asked. So I asked Father, why did you take John, our chairman, to the meeting with you? He's the public face of the committee. When you take him to a meeting, you're taking the committee. Sure, he knows our procedures and probably was a useful resource in straightening things out. But you got a choice. Either this was a private, internal matter that should not have involved anyone from the committee, especially the chairman, who everyone sees as the representative of the committee, or it really was the work of the committee, and we needed to be aware of what was going on. We shouldn't have had to hear about it secondhand and give a third-degree interrogation from people who wanted to know why the hell we were meddling in that business. Now, as I was speaking, Father had a nasty scowl on his face because I was continuing to complain about something he didn't want to discuss any further. But by the time I finished, his expression has changed. He sort of raised his eyebrows and cracked a grin and said, Uh, well, actually, you're right. I get it. John is the face of the committee and does represent us. Now I understand what was the problem. I probably should not have gotten him involved. Well, that satisfied me, I said. The rest of the committee seemed satisfied as well. There was another member on the committee, a woman named Betty, who used to pick me up at my house in my van, drive me to the meeting, and take me home afterwards. After the meeting that night, when she brought me home, she gave me a kiss on the cheek and said, Chris, I've never felt closer to you than I did tonight. She was glad I raised her to stink. The point of the story, though, is not that I had this great victory in a disagreement with Father Paul. It was that most of the time, if not always, Father really did listen to what I and others said when we complained. Now, we didn't win them all. I'm sure that I and many others frustrated the hell out of him on occasion. And he frustrated the hell out of me on occasion. But he would listen when you pinned him down. And if you could make a good argument, you could win one now and then. That's why I love the man so much. I didn't need to win every argument, but I needed to know that my opinion mattered. And it did matter to him. I mentioned before that I taught classes for our RCIA inquiry program for new converts. Father trusted me with that responsibility. I would also attend the classes that he taught. And afterwards, the RCIA team, consisting of Father, me, Judy, my mom, and Sister Timothy, would go out to Denny's after class for a late-night cup of coffee or some snacks. And on the evenings we didn't go out to Denny's, we would generally hang out in the church meeting room for a talk about how the class went or just to socialize. It was on those occasions after class where Father and I would have our share of theological debates as well. You may recall back in episode 6, I had been asking priests tricky theological questions since I was 6 years old. So I guess this was just an extension of that. A lot of it had to do with the nature of miracles and the relationship between religion and science. Famous science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke famously said that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The same is true 
for theological miracles, which seem magical. It might just be science that we don't understand yet. And we would debate the nature of miracles. One time we had a discussion about the Star Trek Next Generation episode, Who Watches the Watchers, Season 3, Episode 4. We watched that episode together. The most interesting part of those discussions was the time that I speculatively asked him, what if someday they scientifically proved that Jesus rose from the dead by a completely explainable scientific method? Theologically, Jesus was fully human, and he completely suppressed his divinity while here on earth so that he could fully embrace the human condition as an example for us. Theoretically, anything that Jesus did, if we had strong enough faith, we could do as well. And so we're told that someday we too will rise. What if science proved that under the proper circumstances, any of us could rise from the dead by the same method that Jesus used? My point was that I think that would not diminish its miraculous nature. For me, just because there's a scientific explanation does not mean that God is not involved. Science is the mechanism by which God does everything. Science is the study of the things God did. Father's response was, if you scientifically proved how the resurrection worked, I'd hang up my collar and walk away. So I guess he needs his miracles to be mysterious in order to be miraculous. Father and I spent other social time together over the years. Sometimes we'd hang out at Judy's and watch football or movies. We'd often gather at her house on Good Friday and re-watch Jesus Christ Superstar over and over again every year. He would celebrate Christmas Eve at our house for many years and would visit us at our lakeside cabin in Brown County a little over an hour south of here. But sadly, all good things come to an end. Priests are typically appointed to serve in a particular parish for a term of six years, and most of the time that's extended for another six years. Then it's quite common for them to rotate to a new place after that 12 years. Father Paul served at St. Gabriel from the summer of 82 until the summer of 96, so he exceeded that typical 12-year term. There were people in the parish who really did not like him at all. It eventually reached the point where it was apparent it was time for him to move on. We needed fresh blood. As much as I was going to miss him, as much as I admired and respect him, a part of me had the sense that he might have already taught me everything he could teach me. I needed a fresh perspective if I was going to continue to grow spiritually. The Archbishop reassigned Father to St. Vincent de Paul Parish in Shelbyville, Indiana, about 45 minutes southeast of here. He served there for many years as pastor and then took the mandatory retirement at age 70. In January, he will celebrate his 95th birthday, and he's still going strong. Because there's a severe shortage of priests, he serves as a substitute priest in parishes all over the Archdiocese of Indianapolis. So he's still celebrating Mass in front of some congregation almost every Sunday, even though he doesn't have any administrative duties any longer. Overall, Father Paul Landwerlin is a great spiritual director, a great pastor, and remains a good friend to this day. I'm very blessed to have him in my life. We were then assigned a new priest who was quite young. It was his first assignment as pastor. Next week, we'll talk about that experience and how it nearly drove me away from St. Gabriel Parish. On the bright side, 
I'll also tell the story of how I experienced what I believe to be a genuine miracle worthy of the canonization of a saint. If you find this podcast educational, entertaining, enlightening, or even inspiring, consider sponsoring me on Patreon for just $5 per month. You'll get early access to the podcast and other exclusive content. Although I have some financial struggles, I'm not really in this for the money. Still, every little bit helps. As always, my most sincere thanks to all of my financial supporters. Your support pays for the writing seminar I attend and for many other things. But most of all, it shows how much you care and appreciate what I'm doing. Your support means more to me than I could ever possibly express. Even if you can't provide financial support, I'm still begging you, please, please, post links and share this podcast on social media so I can grow my audience. I just want more people to be able to hear my stories. All of my back episodes are available, and I encourage you to check them out if you're new to the podcast. If you have any comments, questions, or other feedback, please feel free to comment on any of the platforms where you find the podcast. I'll see you next week as we continue contemplating life. Until then, fly safe, everyone.